Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Cesarich. Today we're going to be in conversation about the largest pan-indigenous confederacy created to stop United States expansion westward in the first part of the 19th century. It was led by two brothers, Tecumseh and Tenskwatawa. Tecumseh is remembered as a great warrior and generous and capable chief who came close to stopping U.S. expansion in the War of 1812 until his death in 1813, which would be followed closely by the collapse of the Confederacy that he helped create. His brother, Tenskwatawa, was a religious leader, a prophet, who taught that the only way to defeat the white man was for indigenous people to return to their traditional ways. For this conversation, I am joined by historian Peter Cousins. He is the author of the book, Tecumseh and the Prophet, the Shawnee Brothers Who Defied a Nation. Peter Cousins, it is a great pleasure to welcome you to this radio program. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. I appreciate the invitation. To understand these brothers, Tecumseh and Tenskwatawa, it's important to understand the people that they come from. These are the Shawnee. The Shawnee are what's called a northeastern woodland people uh, found in and, and around modern day Ohio. Um, but before they were born, it was understand to, to what they were born into. In the 1700s, the Shawnee people had been separated, I guess, in, in some ways, in, in exile from their more traditional lands, from their homes. They were driven out by a number of factors, uh, white European expansion, the Iroquois, and also the American right, right. Revolutionary War. Um, talk to me about the community that these two brothers were born into. Well, it was, as you say, it was a community in, in flux with um, uh, almost, constant, almost constant strife so that there were very few periods during their childhood and adolescence when they enjoyed a normal, peaceful uh, upbringing. Uh, they, they were constantly being uprooted by the, by the causes that you mentioned. The Shawnee uh, were similar to other tribes that occupied uh, what is today the Midwest. They, they uh, all had more in common than they did differences. And the Shawnee, like their, their fellow tribes, were uh, once they regrouped after this uh, Higira, this exodus that was caused by largely by the by the Iroquois expansion, supported by the by the English. They they were as, unlike the many of the tribes or most of the tribes west of Mississippi. The the Indians uh, in the uh, modern day Midwest were semi. They were uh, semi sedentary people. They they. They resided in fixed villages during most of the year and then in uh, hunting camps during the winter. They relied on a combination of, of the hunt, buffalo early on, later almost exclusively deer, and agriculture. Uh, so they, they, again, they were not a nomadic people and they, they preferred to, you know, to live in fixed villages. They, they, tribes in the Midwest, again, unlike tribes in the West, generally got along well with one another. They were uh, uh, patrilineal people. They tended to place uh, the Shawnee in particular greater emphasis on their family ties, their larger kinship ties, and the cl- the clans to which they belonged than to the Shawnee people uh, as a tribe because they had been uh, uh, separated into to different bands for so long. They didn't really have a, a great sense of cohesion as a tribe. They were also born into a world that we, many historians consider the First World War. This We, we call it the Seven Year War, right. the French Indian uh, War. And, and this is important to understand. This is a war that would predate, and many people would say, even uh, as a precursor to the American Revolutionary War in, in the next decade. And what's important to understand about this this war uh, for this story is that many indigenous people either sided with the British or the French. And this is who the war was between the Br- Britain and, and France. And uh, tell me tell me about how this war plays into the story. Well, it plays into the story in, in, in a couple of ways. Of course, the French were defeated and the British, uh, the, the French presence in, in the Midwest had been it'd been, a, it'd been a light presence it mostly tra- you know trading with the indians on, on generally fair terms they didn't exact uh any kind of uh you know harsh terms with the indians they they didn't look to permanently settle the country uh 
Um, the, when the British uh, replaced the French, they treated the Indians a lot more harshly. They didn't. Uh, um, they looked to them as, at them more as an irritant than anything else. And um, those tribes that sided with the French, uh, found, you know, kind of got the, the, the short end of the stick in terms of trade with the British, and, and uh, which they had come to count on because by the end of the French and Indian War by the 1760s, the, the tribes, the, the Shawnee and the other tribes of the Midwest, really had come to depend heavily on, on European goods, weapons uh, for hunting, um, that, uh, clothing, uh, the cooking, where almost almost everything they had come to greater or less extent to depend upon upon the, the British and the French. And uh, with the end of the French Indian War, you had sort of a, a tenuous peace with the British that was broken by a, by an Indian rebellion in 1765 led by Pontiac that almost succeeded in expelling the British from their forts in the Midwest um, and came to be something of a model for Tecumseh at Tengspatawa when they uh, grew to adulthood um, some, you know, some 30 years later. And... Uh, British did succeed more or less in doing until the uh, last years of this, before the outbreak of the revolution. They were generally successful in keeping uh, Ameri- American colonists east of the Appalachians and minimizing contact, disruptive contact between uh, Americans who wanted to, I should say colonists, British colonists, who wanted to push west and settle west of the Appalachians and the Indians, they wanted to re- you know, prevent uh, an outbreak of war, and they were pretty successful in that. Uh, but all that changed with the Revolutionary War, of course. Everything just burst apart. Pontiac and, and the Confederacy that he uh, started uh, is important to understand. As you said, this would be a model for Tecumseh later on. Oftentimes, people have attributed Tecumseh as coming up with the first pan-Indigenous uh, confederacy to oppose U.S. expansion. That's not true. We actually, there, there are precursors. Right. Yeah. What's, 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 what was unique, and maybe I'm jumping beyond here, was unique, unique about Tecumseh's alliance, which had its foundation in the religious and social movement that his brother, Tengswatawa, initiated, is that Tecumseh, and this is, this is uh, you know, unique in, in American Indian history writ large, Tecumseh and his brother were able to assemble a greater number of Indians from a greater number of tribes than any other uh, Indian leader or leaders in Native American history. I mean, by you know, you compare Tecumseh and his brother at the apex of, of their alliance during the War of 1812 before Tecumseh was killed, they uh, uh, enjoyed the allegiance of something over 6,000 warriors and their families. And you look west, and uh, the American Indians in the west were never able to assemble more than 2,000 warriors, and that was the alliance of the Lakota or Sioux and the Cheyenne under Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse to oppose uh, Custer in the U.S. Army in the 1870s. And so the, the alliance that comes to things with Dawa had was much, you know, it was three times as many warriors, um, over a dozen tribes and and covered uh, they, they had uh, adherents from as far north as the headwaters of Mississippi River in Minnesota all the way down to the Creek Indian country in modern day Alabama so it was a pretty pretty broad alliance one last background and contextual question before we get into the lives of both Tecumseh and Tenskwatawa and that is the the, the American Revolutionary War uh, and then also in the war in 1812, and that will be that is getting later on into the story, and we'll be talking more about this a little bit later. But uh, it's important to understand both of these. The Shawnee would side with the British. They were they were always against American expansion. Right, right. They they they, they recognize what it portended uh, for them. Uh, their their hunting grounds. They re, they resided in modern day Ohio. What is modern day Ohio? But their hunting grounds were. Uh, their best hunting grounds were modern Kentucky, which is where the, the American settlers, as they, as they pushed across the Appalachians, they tended to, to move along the Ohio River and settle in Kentucky and, and northern 
north, northern Tennessee, and that was a direct threat to the to the Shawnee. And I don't I don't know how well it was implemented or, or adhered to, but the British Empire, King George the Third, and, and and the gang on the other side of the Atlantic uh, were, was tr- were trying to prohibit uh, right. settlers from going west of the Appalachian Mountains. They were they were pretty they were largely successful until say you know two or three years before the Revolutionary War broke out. Then you had settlers who were starting to make that initial initial tentative push over the Appalachians. But generally speaking, they were they were quite successful. Um, there were uh, land speculators like George Washington, for instance, who sent uh, surveyors uh, west of the Appalachians in what's modern day again modern day Eastern Ohio, West Virginia to try to uh, state claim to land so that when, as, as Washington and others saw, when the British uh, prohibition eventually collapsed, either through the inability of the British to enforce it or, as it turned out, through the American Revolution, they would have uh, they would have the best land available to themselves that uh, preempted. Um, so really, the um, one of the primary factors that's, that's oftentimes ignored but is being recognized more by historians of late as a cause of the American Revolutionary War was land hunger on the part of the settlers. Uh, these would be, you know, kind of uh, marginalized, both rich land speculators and on the other end of the spectrum, marginalized farmers and others who just couldn't cut it in the uh, along the Atlantic colonies and look for their future. Uh, west of the Appalachians, and it was that pressure to move westward and, and the, the British prohibition uh, on it that was uh, a contributory factor, a major one in the uh, outbreak of the Revolutionary War. I want to ask you about the other brother. Tecumseh usually gets most of the attention uh, when people talk about the Shawnee in this period right. of time and this creation of a pan Afri- uh, pan uh, indigenous, excuse me, pan indigenous. Uh, confederacy to oppose westward expansion um, but I do want to ask about the brother Tenskwatawa and frequently in history Tenskwatawa has been portrayed quite differently than Tecumseh. Tecumseh was well respected even by by enemies um, and in history he's been well respected as, as a great leader his brother however ha- who was a religious prophet and I guess we can say even really sort of began this, this movement um, before he took on the name Tenskwatawa. He was known as Lala Wathika. I may be pronouncing these off a little no, bit. No, that's you got it just right. And and he is often portrayed as 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 an irresponsible drunkard who then eventually had a, a conversion, a transformation, and then became a, a spiritual uh, leader. But but he is hasn't usually been remembered as well as, as his brother. T- tell me about the story of Tensk Tenskwatawa. You know, in some ways, it's. It's, I find it more compelling uh, than the story of Tecumseh. I mean, Tecumseh, he was, both he and his brother, Tanks Matawa, his younger brother, were, were sons of a noted Shawnee war chief. So it was expected that they would be uh, themselves uh, formidable warriors at a minimum and, and likely to, be, to, to rise to the level of, of war chief. That tended to, to follow... It's certain, you know, it, within certain clans of, of, of the tribe. Um, Tecumseh, from the you know, from the, the day he was old enough to walk and talk, he was he was charismatic. He drew he drew fe- fellow children to him, his followers quite readily. Girls liked him. He was a, the epitome of, of, of a young warrior and expert hunter. He was handsome, I say, charismatic, dynamic. And Tenskwatawa was something of a, of a misfit, a runt. As a boy, uh, he shot one of his eyes out with an arrow. Um, I mean, he just, he was a misfit. And, he was uh, also born, he, he was a part of triplets. He's part of triplets, which in uh, Eastern Woodland Indian culture was considered an ill omen, a very ill omen, uh, not only for the family who had triplets, but also for the tribe writ large, that the birth of triplets signified or pretended you know, some some disastrous event. Uh, his one of his siblings died shortly after birth, uh, but then he had so he had that going against him as well. Uh, but uh, he was never very very good hunter. He uh, was a loudmouth, a braggart, uh, 
he, as did so many Native Americans in the Midwest, uh, and this is one of the, one of the causes of, of uh, uh, their near downfall before Tanks Matawa stepped to the plate with his doctrine of religious and social renewal. He suffered from alcoholism. He was a, he was a uh, absolute dissolute. Uh, until he had the religious vision that that transformed him uh, literally overnight. And even after that transformation, and it became clear early on that he was the leader of the pan, of the pan Indian movement and he and American and British officials, I, the latter in Canada, recognized his importance and influence before Tecumseh, um, you know some three years into the alliance, uh, broke, in a sense, broke out from under his younger brother's tutelage and became a presence in his own right. They, despite the recognition of Tanks Patawa's influence, both American, both the whites then and historians later on, um, tended to uh, denigrate him because his religious and social beliefs, you know, they were grounded in Indian tradition and they were incomprehensible to, to whites. Whereas Tecumseh, when he emerged in the, uh, as the, the, the greater of the two in, in leading the, the military political alliance, he, um, he espoused objectives that, that whites could readily comprehend, you know, ma- maintaining Indian land against incursions. He, uh, he believed in fighting what whites would consider a humane you know, type of war, not... not uh, uh, harming women and children, and and so he they, he he was comprehensible. Thanks, Batalo, his religious doctrine that that um, you know, for one thing, by calling for a, a return to to uh, more fundamental Indian ways, it, it threatened the the trade between uh, between Americans and English and 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 uh, the Indians, and you know, he he uh, espoused the, the crushing of, of witches uh, as being important to uh, returning the Indians to their traditional ways, which craft was considered, a, you know, very vital but uh, uh, malevolent presence in Indian society, and all that made him kind of repellent to 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 whites. Whereas again, Tecumseh was more readily understandable. So Tenskwak Tawa has suffered all through history uh, from that stigma. Oh, interesting. And when you read about his philosophy, that of Tenskwatawa, it, it does make practical sense. He says that we are over hunting our, our forest and over logging or cutting down too many trees in order to trade these things to the to the white man. Right. Yeah. For for alcohol, uh, in large measure, unfortunately, and and it was it was all to the Indians' long term detriment. And um, Tenskwatawa was right on the bar, and. Um, uh, he uh, he was also practical, though. He, he recognized that uh, whereas the, the, the Indians should have no contact with Americans, the British were all right. The Canadians were all right uh, because they had been, not only had they been allies to the Eastern Brooklyn tribes, but also they, the, uh, as Tex Matawa recognized, you know, the Indians had become so dependent on muskets and, and ammunition in order to hunt and survive. It, it, it couldn't entirely uh, part ways with the whites, but it was in their interest to to part ways with, with the Americans to to maintain uh, what was left of their lands and their society. They, they were anti-American. It's interesting. I, I keep thinking as, as I was preparing for this conversation, I've read about that comes in the past and remember thinking to myself, do not call him Native American, do not call him American at all. This, he, they were against the United States. They, they were, they were, and they and they, and they weren't. Um, Tecumseh and Tenskwatawa, when they they emerged as leaders of, of this growing alliance, they recognized the inevitability of, of treaties, uh, notwithstanding the fact that they were, you know, dubious, uh, dubious legality and, and the. the Methods by which the Americans obtained land through these treaties were were questionable at best. Um, they recognized the status quo that existed when they again uh, came into into power in the 
first tech, first years of the 1800s, they recognized that that really couldn't be couldn't be reversed, and they were willing to tolerate the what they, they'd already lost, which was uh, more than half of Ohio, southern portion of Indiana, and on paper at least portions of Illinois and, and all of Kentucky. Uh, they recognized that as a fait accompli, and they weren't looking to make war to initiate war. What they wanted to do, and Tecumseh uh, took the lead in this respect, was to bring together other tribes to develop a sense of, of, of uh, unity and uh, of purpose and recognize that these lands, we can't negotiate separately with Americans or we'll, you know, we're doomed. We have to come together as a people, as an Indian people, and recognize that all the different tribal lands, they belong to us all in common. We have to stand together to resist any further American encroachment. So they weren't, they, they didn't, they weren't um, naive enough to think that they could roll back the American frontier. I mean, there are already more Americans living in Ohio than there were in all these Indian, all the Indian tribes put together in the, in the Midwest. But they they drew the line at, at further expansion. And Tecumseh really, Tecumseh really, it, it, he wasn't anti-American. He had a lot of American friends, um, a lot of a lot of Ohioans that he considered to be close friends. He grew up with. Uh, uh, as, as a boy, he grew up with uh, several different white boys who had been captured as youths. Uh, and one, in fact, uh, a fellow named Stephen Riddell became a very close friend of Tecumseh and was a follower of his until his uh, late 20s, lived with Tecumseh for over 15 years until he returned to his people voluntarily in Kentucky and you know, Tecumseh. Uh, allowed that because he was an adopted full, adopted Shawnee, he could do what he wanted, uh, and they, they maintained their friendship all through Tecumseh's life, even during the War of eighteen twelve. And so it's, it's wrong to say that he was anti American. Say he was anti American expansion. He, he um, but yeah, yeah, I think that yeah, that, that I think that's right, and that's fair. And but he would have never considered himself an American. No, uh, and in fact, that, that just kind of this bit of a tangent, uh, you know. People sometimes call me out on terminology. So I use the term American Indian. I don't use the term Native Americans. And I, I'm following the, the preferred usage of, of most Native peoples in that respect. Uh, this is something that's not well understood. Uh, that, you know, Indians don't generally refer to themselves as Native Americans. They refer to themselves as Indians. Uh, they first refer to themselves by their tribe and then secondarily as Indians. Uh, and as a rule, Native Americans is not a, not a term that sits employed all that frequently by, by our American Indians. I mean, you have look no further than the, the National Museum of the American Indian here in Washington, D.C. The name was chosen by a, a council of American Indian uh, tribes. Uh, so you'll, you'll hear me say American Indian, and you'll read that in the book. And I'm, in the book, I'm using, of course, the usage of the period and also the preferred usage, I think, of, of, of Native peoples today. This is Letters on Politics, and we are in conversation with Peter Cousins. Peter Cousins is the author of the book, Tecumseh and the Prophet, the Shawnee Brothers Who Defied a Nation. So coming back to Tenskwatawa, and his, his transformation happens in 1805, and then he begins preaching this philosophy. Um, it, it's popular, and, and, not, and maybe even more popular out there side of the Shawnee people with, with other tribal people. Absolutely. It's one of the grand ironies of, of the alliance that Tecumseh and Tenskwatawa put together, which again was the greatest pan-Indian alliance that the United States would ever face. You can't emphasize it enough. And had they prevailed, we can discuss it more later, it would have changed the complexion of, of, the, of the Midwest uh, at a minimum and delayed settlement uh, who knows how long of the American West uh, the Shawnee, as a people, there about half the Shawnee had already had seen the handwriting on the wall, decided they didn't want to fight the Americans, and had uh, relocated to modern day Missouri, which was then part of it was then a Spanish possession, and took advantage of generous Spanish land grants and then resettled uh, west of Mississippi. But among those thousand or so Shawnee remained in Ohio. Uh, ninety percent of them uh, uh, repudiated the teachings of, of Tenskwatawa and Tecumseh, wanted nothing to do with them, and actually 
allied themselves with the Americans in the eventual War of 1812, his appeal, their appeal was greater with other, among other tribes, particularly tribes that were a little farther removed from the immediate threat, uh, tribes in, in Wisconsin, Michigan, and uh, Minnesota that uh, hadn't really felt the, the direct uh, impact of American settlement yet. But again, they, they, they saw that this, would, this was inevitable if they did not come together and form an alliance against the Americans among the tribes that had already been exposed for a long period of time to American influence, especially the pernicious influence of alcohol and whatnot. There was a, a, a lesser tendency to, to follow the teachings of the Tanks it becomes a more of a division among tribes. The tribes that were, that were you know, the more, most immediately affected generally split between those who followed the teachings and leadership of Tecumseh and his brother and those who remained either uh, nominally neutral or actively sided with the Americans. Was alcohol a weapon? And, and I asked that, weapon. yeah, because I, I was thinking about the, the opium wars in China, yeah. in which the British were forcing opium upon the Chinese. And, and it, cause it was, I thought of that comparison with yeah. alcohol here. Yeah, it was not a, not a, not a weapon, not a, a officially government-sanctioned weapon. In, in fact, uh, government officials like William Henry Harrison, who was the governor of um, initially of all the states that comprise the modern Midwest and negotiated uh, some of these dubious land deals with the Indians, he, uh, he lamented the, the, the the the, uh, the the alcohol the influence of alcohol and uh, saw saw recognized and lamented its pernicious influence on the Indians and took some steps to stop it but um, the government's reach was not that great and its 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 um, heart really wasn't into uh, stopping the trade because it did make Indians more pliable and more li- more liable to cede away lands to pay off their debts they had contracted. Um, because they were trading away their uh, their their furs and other goods, trade goods that they had, uh, instead of for things that they needed, they were increasingly trading for alcohol um, sold by uh, uh, illicit traders, and uh, so it was. Although it wasn't officially sanctioned, the government's efforts to send the, the tide weren't that uh, weren't systematic or that great because ultimately it did um it did benefit the government yeah this pan-indian confederacy did did it have a name did it have an identity no it really didn't uh i mean it's historians and yet at the time contemporaries of the company profit of american british contemporaries most actually uh even into the war of 1812 referred to it as the profits alliance even even uh and even after the war began, and Tecumseh was clearly the the dominant uh, leader, uh, you find a lot of newspapers, British, I mean Canadian, and British dispatches and in American papers referring it to as, as the Prophets Alliance. But it didn't really have a formal name, and, and it still doesn't. Uh, a lot of people call it Tecumseh's Alliance or the, the Northwestern Indian Alliance, but there's no agreed upon name for it, even though it was the largest pan Indian alliance. And, and they themselves didn't didn't give it any 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 name. Did did Tecumseh and his his, his brother Tenskwatawa did they work hand in hand? They did, and that's something I I try to emphasize in the book that they really it was very much a uh, uh, symbiotic relationship. Tenskwatawa began the alliance as again as a social, cultural, and religious revival movement. Tecumseh. Uh, when the threat of further American expansion became more immediate and inevitable, Tecumseh uh, came to the forefront because he had greater diplomatic, political, and military leadership skills. And um, so they kind of they, they worked hand in hand. Thanks, Batawa gave the, the alliance its, its moral, uh, religious, cultural legitimacy and foundation. And Tecumseh was the, the rec- of the two was the recognized by the War of eighteen twelve he become the recognized political military leader. Although Tengs Matawa never fully forfeited that role, even during the War of eighteen twelve, uh, at, at the height of the alliance success with the British, Tecumseh was fighting on one front um, 
out of Michigan with the British and Tanks Matawa was fighting on the American flank in, in what is now you know, modern day Indiana and Ohio. So again, it was a symbiotic relationship and Tecumseh never fully uh, transplanted Tanks Matawa. Uh, religion became less important as, you know, after war broke out and the, the, the threat to the, for the remaining Indian lands became, I mean, was, uh, was an existential threat uh, that, you know, that kind of trumped the religious and, and, and teachings of Tanks Matawa, but he was never fully supplanted by, by his brother. Talk to me about what what's happening in Ohio and Indiana. And, it, you, you know, it's interesting. I don't know if people really think about this, but if you look at the name Indiana, it's Indian with an A at the end of it, right? I, I guess the, the land of, of, of Indians. What, what was Indiana before it became a state? Um, it, of course, it changed, changed a great deal in the early years of the 19th century as Americans bought, purchased more and more land. But at the outbreak of the War of 1812, when Tecumseh's alliance finally goes to war, allied with the British, because both Tecumseh and his brother realized that they didn't stand much of a chance of defeating the Americans without not only British weapons supply, but also active British troop participation. On the eve of the War of 1812, um, most of Ohio was, uh, it was a state by then. Uh, Indiana was a territory. Two-thirds of Indiana, the northern two-thirds, were still held by the American Indians. Uh, Illinois, although on paper, had been ceded in large part to uh, the Americans. In fact, the American presence in, in Illinois uh, was very tentative, um, you know, had Fort Dearborn, which is today Chicago, and you had settlements uh, in southern Illinois, but for the most part, it was Indian Wisconsin and uh, was almost entirely uh, Indian land, Minnesota, Indian land, all but uh, the Detroit, immediate region around Detroit, and a little bit around Fort, what is now Fort Mackinac in northern uh, Michigan was also Indian land. So the Indians controlled, you know, the upper Midwest uh, and were allied with the British who owned Canada then. And uh, so when the War of 1812 broke out, it was really in, in the, it was then the West, mid, today's Midwest, uh, that country was up for grabs. Um, had the British and Indians succeeded, uh, you know, modern day Northern Indiana and uh, Wisconsin and, and Michigan and, and Minnesota, uh, most probably would have become Indian country, an Indian buffer state between um, the American United States and, and British Canada. I mean, the British promised the Indians that they would they would fight for those terms. Any treaty that uh, was arrived at, and they were sincere in that promise. So it was really was a war for the Upper Midwest, and again, which depending on how it went, would shape the complexion of the American West as well, because before the American West could be settled, the Midwest had to be consolidated in American hands. The War of 1812 is an important war in this story. This is when the British come and evade the United States, is when they uh, light the U.S. Capitol uh, on fire. Um, and again, as you pointed out, the Shawnee, and in particular, this Pan-Indian Confederacy, uh, sides with the British is getting weapons from the British. The British promise them their own territory, uh, and they were very close to winning, weren't they? They were, and their number. And I, when I started the book, I kind of assumed it was a fait accompli that the Indians were going to lose. But as I as I did the research, I realized that uh, they how close they came on numerous occasions to uh, to defeating the Americans um, in in the Midwest which was uh, then the, the Western theater of the War of 1812, and, uh, and, and holding their lands uh, in the Midwest. They, uh, they were initially very successful. They, with, uh, I mean, Tecumseh's role in, in, in the early stages were extremely important. He, it was he and the Indians, before the British were really able to get their act together, uh, that um, forestalled an American invasion of Canada, pushed the Americans out of uh, uh, Western Ontario uh, and later in conjunction with the British captured the, the only American army in the Midwest, uh, seized Detroit 
and held it for over a year. And I like I like to say that the but ultimately doomed uh, the British and the Indians to defeat uh, was Napoleon Bonaparte, because the British were actively, of course, engaged, and most of the resources were devoted to fighting Napoleon on the continent of Europe, and so they were unable to to uh, send the necessary number of troops and supplies to Canada, uh, ultimately to uh, you know, a portion of which would have been uh, uh, given to the, the to the British forces fighting with Tecumseh, uh, because they weren't able to to devote the necessary resources to the struggle. Um, I mean, it it didn't doom the British and Indians, but it, it made it all the more difficult for them to prevail. And the British failure to to develop a, a strong naval presence um, on uh, on Lake Erie. Um, which ultimately led, you know, the British defeat on Lake Erie, led enabled the Americans to, to uh, retake Detroit and then ultimately invade Canada. So, it, if the British had had greater number, greater resources, military resources, just maybe just three or four more regiments, maybe a couple thousand, three thousand more men, uh, I think that they would have prevailed. The generalship was much better than the Americans. The, uh, the Indians fought well when they were alive with a sufficient number of British. Otherwise, and this is one of the Achilles heel, of, I mean, with the Achilles heel of Tecumseh and his brother is that, and also it, it pays tribute to how um, charismatic they were and how great their influence was. And that is that in their alliance, it was a, li- it was a voluntary alliance. No Indian leader, be he a war leader of a tribe, portion or tribe or the leader of, uh, of, of an alliance had any institutional means of compelling obedience or compelling his followers to adhere to his orders or his, his, his mandate leadership. It was all voluntary. And oftentimes after victory, the Indians would just go home uh, for, a, for a season to uh, feed their families or whatever. And uh, if they didn't agree with a particular tactic, they weren't obliged to follow. So that, you know, you know, whereas American and British commanders, of course, had had a chain of command. They had, they had institutional means to compel uh, their troops to follow. The Indians didn't have, the Indians, it was very, it was extremely democratic. And that Tecumseh and Kings Patel were able to marshal this huge number of warriors and keep them together so long when it was all because of the, their, the strength of their characters and their appeal that, that's, you know, that speaks volumes. Tecumseh was a very principled man. Um, yes, in, in, a, in a time in which it was very common to torture prisoners, he prohibited torturing prisoners, including mm-hmm. white prisoners. Uh, he also made sure that uh, the elderly, uh, the ill, women, disabled children were all were all taken care of. Yes, he was. A, he was a. He was not only a great man. He was a good. Man. He was a very a very good man, and. Uh, uh, he, the uh, popularity he enjoyed among Americans while he was still alive and fighting the Americans can be dated from uh, a battle in the uh, uh, Battle of Fort Meigs in Ohio, in which uh, uh, several hundred Kentucky volunteers were captured by the British and Indians. And some of Tecumseh's Indian allies had begun killing, massacring the captured Kentuckians. Uh, and to come so when he got wind of this, he rode into the throng of Indians and, I mean, you know, using his, his war stick and his admonitions, he put a stop to the slaughter. And uh, Kentuckians recognized what he'd done. They saw him do this. And when they were paroled, they went home. And the war was still going on and told the story of how it comes to save their lives. And so he was, you know, he was his humanity was recognized and appreciated by Americans, uh, even as he was fighting them. How did Tecumseh die? He died uh, at a battle in, in uh, western Ontario in 1813, October 1813. This was after the Americans had, the British had lost the Battle of Lake Erie uh, to the Americans, which broke the British supply lines back into eastern Ontario and and Eastern Canada, and really compelled the British to abandon uh, not only Detroit but also their their posts on the uh, 
you know, east bank of the Detroit River, kind of, kind of a abandoned westernmost Ontario. Um, Tecumseh's and his allies were forced to the decision of whether to follow the British into Canada or, or not. I mean, and and the larger part of Tecumseh's alliance abandoned him then and there because they they had they were fighting for their own land, not for the British. Uh, Tecumseh, a few hundred of his staunchest followers, decided that really their only hope uh, resided with standing by the British, no matter how dark things looked. And uh, at a battle called the, the Battle of the Thames on the Thames River in Western Ontario on October 13, uh, Tecumseh was killed fighting beside the British, fighting against you know his old nemesis, William Henry Harrison. His, um, his body was never uh, found, not clearly uh, definitively identified by anyone in the field, but there was no doubt he was killed. As his brother said as much, the British commander knew it. I mean, he, he was killed at the Battle of Thames. But I mean, ironically, his body was never never found, never recovered. And uh, with his death, uh, what remained of the alliance pretty much crumbled. Uh, Tanks Patawa just, you know, he had maybe... 300, 400 warriors, their families who stuck with him uh, for the next two or three years. And uh, he made a couple of abortive efforts to fight with the British later in the War of 1812, but he just was not a military leader. He just didn't have it in him. And so really the, the alliance effectively died. Um, what remained of the alliance, the alliance, larger alliance died when the British abandoned um, Detroit, and then also Western Ontario, Westernmost Ontario, and what remained of it died when Tecumseh died on the banks of the Thames River. I'd be remiss not to ask about William Henry Harrison, who you just mentioned. He was a U.S. governor of the Indiana Territory. Uh, he has the distinction later on of serving one of the shortest uh, presidential terms in history. Isn't this the story? Isn't it William Henry Harrison who when he gave his um, inaugural address, did it in the freezing cold, was warned not to, and ended up getting pneumonia and died a couple yeah, months later. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. And because then not only did he give his, his address in those conditions, then he stayed on for the inaugural ball afterwards, you know, was chilled, uh, caught his death in pneumonia. And I think he would have been a decent president if he, if he lived. I mean, Harrison, he's, he's necessarily the, the, uh, the bad guy in this book. Um, but he's he's also was a very talented man, and he, he was not not entirely unsympathetic figure. It just fate pitted him against to come sent Tanks Batawa uh, from the very beginning. Um, he he really played. In, I mean, he, initially he was governor of the whole north northwest territory, and, and uh, uh, until it was shaved down to just the Indiana territory. So, at, at, when he was negotiating these, these treaties, that Thomas Jefferson ordered him to negotiate with the Indians to try to wrestle as much land as he could he he uh was i mean he essentially was a uh, potentate of uh modern day ohio illinois indiana uh michigan and wisconsin i mean he really had a large bail of it, and he, and, and uh he was an extremely important figure in american history in the, in the uh first decade and a half of the uh, 19th century and as we move to wrap up i, I want to ask you about the record of Tecumseh and Tenskwatawa and what we have. And, and, in, and maybe let me first ask about somebody you already talked about um, who was a young uh, white child who was adopted. Oftentimes people and children were kidnapped, eventually adopted, even raised as a, a part of the family, I, I right. guess. Very uh, common. And, and, and in many of these people would go on to write accounts about that. And, and many of them said they preferred uh, Absolutely, being with the indigenous people and, and growing Absolutely. up that way, even though they maybe later on were forced or conditions required them to to, to go back to to, to, to white society. Um, was his name Stephen Rod Rodell? Rodell, Stephen Rodell. Yeah, he was a. a I'm, he was a as a boy of twelve. He was captured in a, in a British and Shawnee raid um, in Kentucky during the Revolution. Uh, the end of the Revolutionary War. He was again twelve years old. Tecumseh was twelve years old at the time, also, and um, he was uh, adopted by the Shawnee. And um, 
was became a member of, of, of the village in which Tecumseh and Tanks with Power resided. He and Tecumseh became very, very close friends, uh, very intimate friends. And this was the third uh, American boy who Tecumseh had befriended, and, uh, which, and to, which to me is absolute evidence that Tecumseh uh, spoke very good English. I mean, I, there was, I had very little doubt that you know, Rodell became very fluent in Shawnee. How did he learn it? He learned it from Tecumseh. How did Tecumseh learn English from the American boys with whom he was raised? Um, Rodell fought under Tecumseh when Tecumseh was an, a, a, a young war leader and uh, didn't leave him until uh, uh, he was in, but both of them were in their late 20s. Went back to Kentucky, became a Baptist minister, uh, actually then returned to Shawnee country after Tex Matawa's emergence as a prophet and uh, had debates with Tex Matawa, the merits of Christianity versus uh, the nativist uh, faith of Tanks Potawa. And they all remained friends, even though it comes to consider Riddell to be a little misguided by then. They, 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 they thought he went a little close. crazy, but they still accepted him. A little, a little him. crazy, yeah, but, yeah. but no, he was still a Shawnee. Been, once you're adopted into one of these tribes, you are a member of that tribe for life. And uh, with all the privileges that, that accrue to that, including leaving it if you, if you want to. And so his record was extremely important for the, for the early years of Tecumseh's he, life. He wrote, he wrote a book about it. He wrote, he wrote a, it wasn't a book, it was not published, but it, uh, at the time, it uh, it was preserved, thankfully. It was a long manuscript about his time among the Shawnee and about Tecumseh and Tanks with Tau. And thank, you know, thank heavens it was it was preserved and that is, is available. Um, it's, it's a book now. It's, in a, it's a book now, yeah. It's, it's a small, you know, small volume. Uh, but it's, it's very, very good reading, very reliable, too. Everything that Riddell says checks out with with other accounts and it's entirely, entirely credible. And, uh, you know, I would close by saying just the wrap, kind of wrap up, you know, where Tecumseh and Tanks with Power stand in the pantheon of Indian leaders. Is that, you know, I kind of argue in the book uh, on the basis of evidence and, and their success and, and, and how close they came to, again, uh, establishing a, a viable Indian homeland with British support. You know, you have to, without a doubt, Tecumseh, was the, the most influential and successful Indian war and political leader in uh, American Indian history, American history writ large. Uh, also, undoubtedly, Tecumseh and his brother were the most influential Indian brothers in, in uh, American Indian history. Tecumseh, Tex Matawa was the most successful and influential prophet in a culture that really um, believed in prophecy and placed a great deal of of, 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 of faith and gave a lot of great deal of support to those who they believe were genuine prophets. Uh, so Tanks Matawa, in his own right, was the greatest Indian prophet. And together, you know, you know, given the influence that they had, I you have to consider them to be two of the really greatest brothers in American history writ large, if you're giving Native Americans their due. So they really you know, had, a, had an outside... They're the greatest outside. brothers of, of... I mean, you're talking... About U.S. history in that as well. Uh, U.S. history, absolutely. I mean, they, 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 uh, again, if you, if you give American Indians, Indians their due, you have a pair of brothers, one who was the greatest war leader uh, in American Indian history and the other who was the most influential prophet. Um, and, and together, I, you know, there were very few American brothers in the political sphere who, uh, you know, I liken them to kind of, like, I don't know, American Indian Kennedys in terms of the, the influence they had within their within their culture and society. Peter Cousins has been our guest. He has joined us for a conversation about his book. It's called Tecumseh and the Prophet, the Shawnee Brothers Who Defied a Nation. Peter Cousins, I've enjoyed our conversation. Thank you. I have too very much. Thanks so much, Mitch. And thank you for your, for your wonderful questions too.